What is privacy if it does not protect personal liberty? We have talked about data, we have talked about surveillance, but what about bodily protection itself? And I think this is one of the core areas in which privacy also interacts with next level of criminal investigation, how DNA is being used, how, uh, and there are various other aspects to how privacy richly actually applies to criminal justice. For this we have Shreya Rastogi. She works at Article 39A, which is earlier known as a death penalty clinic, and now has a wider mandate. They do fantastic work, and I'm really thrilled, and I'm looking forward to hear what she has to say. Thank you for that introduction, Apar. Uh, just uh, to uh, correct you, it's Project 39A. It's, yeah, it's, uh, but it is inspired by Article 39A of the Constitution. So, um, I just wanted to, um, um, as Afar set it up, I want to talk about uh, privacy in the context of criminal law and I thought that, I mean, since there is, it's, it's, it's extremely broad, so I would want to limit my five minutes to talking about it in the context of uh, DNA evidence. Uh, now, the use of, uh, and the invasion of privacy, in the, let's, let's begin there, the invasion of privacy for the larger public interest and uh, especially in the context of um, uh, criminal investigation, that's something that we've, uh, that the, that the legit legitimacy of that kind of state action and the proportionality of that kind of state action, I think everyone's taken it for granted that, yes, in these contexts, privacy can actually be, uh, uh, can be invaded into. Uh, however, I think that in the context of uh, DNA evidence, it has to be considered differently. And that's precisely because of the nature of what um, your DNA can tell about you and about everyone else that you are biologically related to. And that's where I want to like take this uh, this uh, talk. So, uh, well, let's, let's start with what is the entire purpose of a criminal trial, right? It is to individualize. You're basically trying to answer the fundamental question of who committed that offense if you don't actually know who the real culprit is and how they did it, right? And uh, and then when we're looking at the first question of who committed that offense, that would usually come up in those kind of circumstances where uh, the identity of the culprit is not known. And, uh, and here the investigating authorities uh, often rely on forensic evidence because this is supposed to be uh, it's supposed to give you that kind of objectivity which other pieces of evidence in a criminal trial may not give you. Like for instance, uh, if someone has uh, uh, last seen uh, the, the, the victim with the offender, right? Uh, you don't know whether they're actually telling you the truth or not. You're obviously going to rely on other uh, things in the, um, in, in the criminal trial to say that yes, all of that is matching up uh, to actually come to the culprit. Now forensic evidence here is supposed to give you that uh, key of um, objectivity, supposedly. And when we think of forensic evidence which can help you individualize, uh, one may think of, uh, well, blood grouping, uh, fingerprint evidence, bite mark evidence, and then there's DNA. And I think that DNA has to be considered very differently from all other pieces of evidence uh, because uh, it is just so immutable. Uh, and also because the level of individualization of DNA is very different from these other pieces of evidence. Uh, and that's because it, your genetic code can tell you um, not just about uh, um, you know, your physical attributes but about uh, what kind of diseases you're prone to. It can tell you um, who, you know, when you may actually, I mean there is research which is happening right now about uh, uh, longevity of people's lives which can be determined through DNA. Uh, you're able to, um, in fact, uh, research is helping people change your DNA to some extent so that you could, uh, um, you know, have certain traits which become more dominant uh, than others. And, and finally, DNA also then, as I was saying, uh, it helps you not just tell about that individual in uh, in question, but about people that they may be related to. And this has uh, very recently become uh, quite uh, popularly known in the criminal context, especially with what's happening uh, in the United States, uh, with many cases unfolding because of what they're calling as genetic genealogy. Now, uh, and, and, and that, that, that's a very interesting space, uh, because what's happening there is uh, there are several 
uh, DNA databases where people have volunteered their genetic information because they want to find out lost relatives. Um, right, and um, and you had the investigating authorities tap into um, and, and legitimately so um, tap into these uh, publicly available um, databases, put in the DNA profile of what they support. I mean, what they think is actually uh, uh, the real uh, culprit's profile because they've not been able to. The other piece of evidence has not worked out in that case. They haven't been able to find um, any leads which will help them uh, resolve that. So they put it into these databases and they try and see if there are hits which are coming up, right? And these hits are not actually to uh, one particular individual, but there are percentages of matches that they're able to find. And through that, they're putting together different pieces of information to see who would this uh, uh, DNA actually belong to. And that's something that uh, is, isn't just something that has been done in the US. I would say that we've seen a few examples of this happening even in India. Um, uh, two years ago in Himachal Pradesh, in this case of uh, the Kothai uh, uh, rape case, uh, the CBI also tried something like this with uh, um, where they would where they were not able to find any links to the actual culprit. Mm -hmm. So they collected DNA of about close to 250 individuals from a certain village and they tested all of that because they were not able to find any other leads and they were trying to see whether that matches uh, the DNA which was there uh, uh, which matched with, uh, with the victim, right? Um, and, and I think that that really is uh, where, um, uh, I mean, um, we had Raman uh, talking about the why of it now here is where I think the proportionality of this kind of collection should come into act, uh, should uh, should be called into question because is this the only way in which that this crime uh, could have been solved and also what happens to the DNA profiles of all of these individuals which was collected where is this stored who has access to this all of that is something that has to be uh, considered and finally I want to just leave uh, uh, with questions about uh, the DNA profiling bill. Um, now, we've, much has been said about this uh, already, so I, I won't linger on this, but I think that uh, two, two points over here. One, which would be the DNA laboratories which would be under the purview of this DNA uh, profiling bill? That isn't extremely clear. We don't know who's going to have access to the DNA information which will be collected. The, uh, the information can be collected from all kinds of suspects in all kinds of crimes. And I think that that's also a very key difference from the criminal DNA databases. Obviously, the government said that these databases are get, uh, exist in other countries. But the key uh, difference there is that it is limited by types of crime and it's limited by who can access this information, none of which is present in the current law. And I think that's where uh, uh, the questions about uh, what implications it has on privacy, especially genetic privacy, uh, should be considered.